it's been a couple weeks since the last UFC card, and I'm going to ask you a quick question to start off the show. What do you think has been trending? What do you think the fans have truly been after the past couple weeks? Taylor Swift or UFC Vegas 80? Oh, dude, wow. We're already, get, I'm already starting with the hard questions, with the tough questions. Yeah, man. man, dude. I mean, come on, man. Like, let's be real. You're right. The UFC big, Vegas the 80. The big UFC Vegas 80. <laughs> the story. 80 of these things, dude. Like, only 20 more to 100. I mean, everybody <laughs> had their eyes glued to this one, man. Hey, man. <laughs> While the rest of the world may be looking at Travis Kelsey, at least America is looking at Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift, we're over here talking about MMA because that's what you guys want from us. So let's get into Yeah, we don't UFC have... Vegas we don't have we don't have any uh, any more smooth, you know, transitions with the uh, Taylor Swift yeah. into our into our product until um, she starts dating like yeah, D- Diego Sanchez. You know, yeah, <laughs> two two guys two guys fighting in a cage. You know, you know, kind of night and day with uh, with Taylor Swift. But um, well, let's get into the fights, man. <laughs> <laughs> like we said, we're here for that purpose. But um. Honestly, UFC Vegas 80 was kind of a sleeper. Like, the more I looked at it as it came up, it's not fights that are going to excite the masses, but if you're a hardcore fan and you see certain names on there, it wasn't too bad of a card, and it turned out all right. And I think the main event was arguably, like, best-case scenario because Bobby Green is so fun. And to tell you guys what happened, in case you didn't see it, Bobby Green starched Grant Dawson 33 seconds with a clean left hand. And big upset by the bookmaker standards. I mean, he was like, what, plus 380, I think they were saying, on DraftKings before the start. So upset by their standards. But I'll ask you this. What, what did you think of Bobby Green's performance, and did you expect something like this? Uh, well, no. I mean, I don't want to say no in the sense like I didn't expect this at all. But I think it was – I think you'd be hard-pressed to say that it wasn't – you know, surprising, especially in 30 seconds. Um, so there, that that definitely was pretty like you know. I think the, I think for a while now that it should be known that Bobby Green is one of the more electrifying lightweights in the division. He gets who is obviously you just saw him display that one punch power, and he just put the fight away just like that. I think where you know maybe where the the bookmakers uh, got too comfortable and messed up with was, um, you know, I guess just at this point in each of their careers, you know, obviously Grant Dawson is vying basically for where Bobby Green is like now. And it's crazy because Bobby Green, like it just has been around for a while now. And he and, wasn't ranked, which is funny because Bobby Green almost has more of the masses respect because of just the names that he's fought and how long he's been around i mean yeah i don't yeah i guess they weren't giving they weren't giving bobby green enough credit to you know defend takedowns and whatnot and uh, can i ask you this like because coming into this fight i didn't realize the odds were what they were until the broadcast honestly because i thought this fight was a good matchup not because grant isn't exactly who we think he is. Yeah, it's just I because mean, Bobby Green is so good, and like, besides the grappling, where I think Dawson had a massive advantage, I think over the course of five rounds, Bobby Green has showed that he can give people fits with his stand up, and he has cardio. Grant Dawson, you know, we've talked about him in the past. He's improved at this, but he's had questionable cardio at times, and I don't think his stand up is as good as Bobby Green's to be quite. And I think you know the results kind of speaks for speaks for itself in this case but i, I don't know like you kind of like you said it's a surprise that it happened in the way that it did but i don't think the win was as surprising as it maybe is for the rest of the fan base yeah probably probably i think what they really thought was you know grant dawson's gonna he's gonna control the middle he's got the smaller cage and the apex and you know bobby green is uh you know there's bobby green's gonna be going against the clinch a lot of the fight and you know Grant Dawson's. That's how Grant Dawson probably you know they thought was gonna work in his uh probably like some sh- some sh- some short striking, put some damage on the body and whatnot, and then kind of flip the script yeah, on that one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Bobby Green was not wasting any time. 
I just don't think he gets enough credit, man. Like, he's a true OG of the sport. I was looking up his topology today just to, like, read some of the names that he's fought. And more than that, I was looking at the promotions and fought in Strike Force, Affliction. These are, like, old-school MMA promotions. This dude's been around and has fought so many of the best people in his weight class. And, you know, he may not have won all those fights, but he's won enough, in my opinion. And just to be around still after all these years and beating top guys like Grant Dawson, you know, ranked number 10. Bobby Green's a top 10 lightweight right now, technically. I don't know what the rankings are going to come out with. You know, we're recording this on Monday. It'll be out probably by the time the pod comes out. So now, as we always do, we got to talk about what's next. I think there's a couple options for Bobby Green. I mean, Renato Moicano called him out. Dan Hooker had called out Matus Gamrot, but he is. Set, I think he said he's looking to fight by the end of the year. Bobby Green wants December, so he thinks that Dan Hooker might be in for that. So I'll ask you this: Which of those two would you rather see, Moicano or Hooker? I. Mm, so I think with, I think with Moicano, Bobby Green, I feel like that's probably a better um, stylistic matchup, and I think. Even with those two at their points in their careers, I think they're honestly, maybe I mean, I think we, I think we this go without saying too, like you know the money would have to be right and all that. Whereas I think with Dan Hooker, like Dan Hooker's obviously, I think Dan Dan Hooker's probably well now it's interesting because you know because at this point in Bobby Green's career, like how much do you really see like. And making a push for the title, you know. And that's not even, you know, you alluded to the money, too. That's not even his main motivation. He's very open about just being in it for the bag. Yeah. And that's why I think that he probably doesn't mind whoever's next as long as the pay is good, kind of like you said. And, yeah, I, I mean, me personally, I kind of agree with you. I think Moicano is a better style matchup, at least on the feet. I think, obviously, when it gets on the ground, Moicano is a jiu-jitsu wizard, so that's like... It's a whole nother ball game. But Dan Hooker is, you know, he's a long striker, good kickboxer. He kind of keeps people at range. And I don't know if Bobby Green's style is really the a good fit against Dan Hooker. But it's a big fight, and I think it would get him paid accordingly. I think that, yeah. that could be a pay-per-view, like, main card, you know, three-rounder in the middle there. Dan Hooker, too, is, you know, he's still fighting these these younger dudes and seeing where he's at in this in this point in his career and be good to know, see him against an OG. That's what I'm saying. Like I think it makes sense. Yeah, but um, be a scrap. That's for yeah, sure. Yeah, I don't know. They're I don't know. Yeah, they probably for a guy like Dan Hooker. Like I think it's someone that you know UFC wants to still put in that marquee like on pay-per-view main cards and all that. So I mean that fight could be pay-per-view main card at this point. Bobby Green's been been on that stage. That's the thing. Like he hasn't won every single one of them. Like a couple of the ones that I think of, you know, one especially is when he lost. I think it was to Dustin Poirier on oh, was it like UFC one ninety nine? I want to say yeah, something wow. like that. Long time ago, and like this is what I'm saying. Like he's been he's been in these positions. He's just always been a guy who's lost that big fight. And you know, last time for Bobby Green, it was the Islam Makhachev fight. I think that was a bit of an uphill battle to begin with with him, so I don't really give him any flack for that. But he's in a position now where he, like you said, it's not your first thought with Bobby Green, but hey, man, he's in the top ten. So And Dan Hooker is ranked above him. If he keeps moving up, you never know what could happen. But that top five at lightweight, they just don't tend to look down in the rankings like Gaethje, Poirier, Connor. I don't yeah. even know if Connor's still ranked. Probably isn't, actually, now that I said that. Even though he's not. <laughs> Chandler, though. I think Darius is um, a little more likely to fight somebody. I think I saw that there was like a rumor that he was fighting Saryukian. I don't know if that's the, actually the case, though. So I won't like report on that until it's actually official. But, um, yeah, I mean, unless you have any final thoughts on Bobby Green, I'm willing to move on to the co-main. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, like we said it, dude. I mean, I think... The moral of this fight is like, you know, you don't, I guess you don't count out, you don't count out a striker like this, like no matter like what age he really is, honestly, especially really? with the guys that Bobby Green has fought. I so, really like you don't count anyone out in general in MMA. Like you truly never know what's going to happen. 
So, co-main though, I think the UFC was pretty happy with that outcome. Uh, Joe Pfeiffer, pretty hyped up prospect, I'd say, and rightfully so. I mean, he's fun to watch. He's great on the mic, and um, this was just an outstanding performance. You know, it was a bit patient. He did show good composure because um, Abdul Razak Al Hassan, he's not exactly like a volume striker, so there's not many openings, and you can't really go crazy against a guy like that because he has such knockout power himself that one wrong move and then you're on the other end of the highlight reel. So I thought Joe Pfeiffer showed a lot of good composure in this fight. Typical power like he does. The intensity that he brings into the octagon is truly like unparalleled. And I think Al Hassan really felt the brunt of that, especially at the end, of, end there with that arm triangle. But what do you think of uh, Mr. Pfeiffer, dude? Yeah, it's good to see wins like this from you know up and coming prospects and you know the co-main of the card too like it's pretty it's pretty encouraging it's pretty exciting so um yeah that's that's that i think it's I tough think to put definitely in words. definitely made a lot of new fans overnight and rightfully so man i liked them on the uh on the mic usa motherfucker <laughs> with the flag by the way very happy that the UFC flag ban is now gone because that was one of the weirdest little eras mm. in UFC history there. I mean, there's so many times where you'd want to see a fighter carrying his or her home flag. And Dana mentioned uh, the Mexican Independence Day card. That one was one where he really like felt it, and the flag ban is now gone. So I'm happy about that. But uh, last thing we'll talk about with the UFC card before we get into a little bit of Bellator is Joaquin Buckley and you know not a typical Joaquin Buckley Buckley statement in the sense that it wasn't a crazy knockout but I almost thought this was more impressive than most of his knockouts besides that one where he did that crazy spinning kick that that's like unbeatable <laughs> you can't beat that but um nonetheless Alex Morono was his opponent he had a really dominant performance against him and the move to 170 was fairly recent. I think this is like his second or third fight. Why I look for that? What did you think of his performance against uh, Alex Morono in there? So yeah, I mean, like you mentioned, you mentioned the spinning, the spinning heel kick that like pretty much put him on the map. But it, it's been, it's been kind of tough sledding since then for Joaquin Buckley. Like obviously facing, you know, I think like you can know, I interrupt you to tell you what the Tapology classifies that knockout as against uh, Kasang and I that jump <laughs> yeah. jump spinning back kick. I agree. Yeah. I, that's a good name for it. I don't know if that's like it that was, has to be yeah. The it was <laughs> that. It was that like just insane and just perfectly executed. It's like literally one of the best knockouts of all. Like time. calling it right. a spinning heel kick is a disservice. So you know, a shout out to Tapology for that. Yeah. Glad they're but, giving us something to call it. But continue, sorry, continue. I just read yeah, that. And I, I was mean, like, all right. <laughs> all I was saying is like it's kind of it's been tough sledding since then. I think like you know he got that he got that knockout and then just immediately got shot up when competition and he's facing so. Um, it's definitely but even this down. fight, obviously, with Morono, you were mentioning how this is, you know, this is a this is a change to 170 for Morono. And yeah, this, well, no, for Buckley. For this Buckley. is his uh, second fight at 170, by the way. I yeah. Find it. And so, maybe that's it. Maybe this is where he's, you know, where he's uh, really supposed to be. And, you know, we'll, we'll see. I, I still, I still, yeah, it's, I still think he's got a good trajectory going especially if he's going to keep winning fights like this so yeah, morono's game man like he's not the type of guy who's gonna blow you away on the mic but he's a gamer and he always comes to scrap he's a tough out as we could see i mean buckley hit him with some big shots and morono didn't go away so i i was just super impressed by his performance and like you said i think 170 could be a home for him and let's get him against someone ranked I, I think he deserves it. Morono's a tough, tough dude. Mm, so yeah, we'll maybe see. one more. Yeah, but we'll who see knows. who's who's down for that. Who's down for that fight? Yeah, man. Well, that's it for the UFC for now. Let's talk about Bellator three hundred, the big, uh, big card for them over the weekend. And I guess the part where you have to start is the main event with just how impressive Usman Nurmagomedov is, and. You know, we were talking about this before the show. There's a lot of people who 
are more casual fans who aren't going to give him the credit he deserves or saying he's beating cans. But when you're just watch, like you just got to watch him in there. And I'll put it, I'll start off with a story of a couple weeks ago in like the build up to this fight, a friend of mine um, sent me a, a TikTok that he saw of Usman Nurmagomedov's question mark kick. And he's like, and he doesn't know much about MMA. He's like, newer fan trying to get into it but like doesn't know much about the technique and he's like dude i don't know shit about what i'm looking at but that looks hard (laughs) and like it is and when you watch him if i can find it maybe i'll put the video in but uh it's just so crazy like the high level of striking mixed with the grappling that he has and he has the kickboxing of like the elite strikers in the sport and then he has the Nurmagomedov pedigree on the ground. It's unreal. I, I put in the notes here that like he reminds me of like a more polished version of Zabit. Because Zabit was very similar to that. Really good kickboxer, great grappling. He just didn't have great cardio. Usman has great cardio. So he destroyed Brent Primus this weekend. Won by just a dominant unanimous decision. And I was just super impressed. I think he, he deserves a lot of credit for that. No matter what people think of Bellator, it's just impressive. Really impressive. But uh, I guess the co-main event, you know, that was... I guess to more casual MMA fans, I would say that this was probably a bigger fight just because of Chris Cyborg and who she's fought in the sport. You know, uh, Amanda Nunes, now Kat Zingano. I think that was a big name to cross off her list because their paths, it's surprising that they hadn't crossed until now i wish this fight happened a few years ago but either way chris cyborg just made it look easy and she's been doing that since she got into bellator really she's been doing that her whole career outside of amanda nunez so um yeah man i I don't really even know if there's much to say in terms of that fight so i'm just going to kind of move on to um what the next thing is for Chris Cyborg because that's always been up in the air but it seems like she's happy at Bellator now and that's where she's going to stay for the time being Leah McCourt she just beat Sarah McMahon on that same card which set up the new title fight Chris Cyborg versus Leah McCourt now this brings us into a bigger conversation and me and you have talked about Bellator on and off air here there's problems that they've had with their marketing in the past I don't think this card was a product of that. I think this card was pretty good, and I think they did as good of a job as they could have done to promote it. I think in the end, they kind of were better served because that one title fight fell off, which made it a typical three title fight card, which it made it feel familiar for MMA fans. Like, this feels like a big card. It's not over doing it like you kind of put. So that was a good start, even if it wasn't by their own hand. But I thought they did a good job. Like, the production was good. And I enjoyed, like, the fights that I saw. And, um, but the matchups, you know, I see Chris Cyborg versus Liam McCourt. And this is no disrespect to Liam McCourt. It's just when you look at the resumes, it's not even close. And I think in order for Bellator to really build the stars that they do have, they have to get better depth around it. And they keep losing out on these opportunities. And I don't know if it's just because they think they're going to get sold but, you know, I mentioned when Derek Brunson got released, or didn't get released, he left the UFC, I said Bellator should be in the market for him, and then the PFL swoops him up. That's not a guy that you can miss when you don't have contenders. I mean, we just saw what Johnny Evelyn did at 185 to Leon Edwards' brother. It was just crazy. And Derek Brunson is a guy, if you put him into that middleweight division, it's actually kind of fun. And it, it, the Bellator middleweight division right now is actually pretty good in general, and they have a lot of underrated guys. And Derek Brunson might be a, might have been a dude who could have unlocked some of their potential, but instead he's in the PFL, and we have the champions fighting these contenders who have matchups that are just super favorable. And I, I don't know, man. I think they really shoot themselves in the foot sometimes because. In the beginning when we started this podcast, I thought Bellator was a clear number two to the UFC. Now I think they're number four. I, I put one in the PFL above them. You know, no particular order. I think PFL and one are like interchangeable. If you're going global, I'd say one. But it it's unreal how much they've kind of shot themselves in the foot. And I feel weird like 
shitting on them after giving them all the credit. But, you know, this was the pinnacle. And you're not going to see a Bellator card that was that good for probably yeah. a little while. And that's not good if you want sustained success. Like, Bellator can't just have one good week every quarter and compete with the UFC that has two good weeks, two to three good weeks every month, sometimes even four. So, like, it's just they're not on a level playing field at this point. And it sucks because it seems like they've just gone downhill. And I, mean, I don't know. I'll, like, let you, I'll open it up to you. I know I kind of just, you know, ranted a little bit there, but... Yeah, like, I think with Bellator is, I think they bank on, you know, who they already have and who they already, like, are, you know, in terms of people that are, you know, coming up and trying to just stick somewhere for a minute and build their name. I guess maybe, like, a, I guess, like, a Michael Chandler, for instance, you know, some, you just kind of, like, and take these guys who want them to be homegrown in Bellator, and then, like, once they're, you know, established and pretty much, then they'll go out. They've, then once they've already established their Bellator career, they've done good things for Bellator, made Bellator a lot of money, like, they'll go out to a bigger, better opportunity, and then, you know, become and like, even this is, more worldwide, because Bellator... Keeps happening. Yeah. And, and they don't see it. Like, it makes no that's, sense. Yeah, that's that's the issue. They they they're too comfortable with who they already have, and in terms of like, you know, just putting even cards like this where you were supposed to have four title fights, and like that in certain terms of like for the future and all that. It's like okay, well that's great. We just put on this huge mega card. So, like you're just saying, you know, where's what you know what's going to be the next, like, Bellator card to really be glued to for the next month. And there's nothing. There's, like, you, yeah, there's not. And it, it's so tough, and the, Yeah, it's a tough thing, too, because it's, like, the champions and, obviously, the household names, like, and because of this inferior competition that they're getting like they're really not even breaking much of a sweat when they're fu when in these fights and that's why and they want to leave because they don't get enough credit like michael chandler before he left ben Askren before he left the big knock on bellator fighters is like yeah but he's not going to do or she's not going to do that in the ufc <laughs> and we're seeing it now yeah vadim and... nemkov you know i talk about him all the time i thoroughly believe that he is the best 205er on the planet right now. You know, who knows what's going to happen at UFC 295. That might make me feel a little differently. But right now, I'd say it's Vadim Nemkov. But a majority of the fans, they don't realize how good this guy is because they don't want to give him the credit because he's in Bellator. And then Usman Nurmagomedov is another one. I see comments already. He's beating up cans. He wouldn't do this in the UFC. Yeah, he would. <laughs> like, that's the thing. I'm not saying that he'd be ch these guys would be champions, but they'd be in the upper echelon. You know, Michael Venom Page right now is a free agent. He's not going to probably go back to Bellator. There's, I've been hearing that him to the UFC is pretty close. Like, they're working on that, and it looks good. I think MVP wants to test himself uh -huh. against the upper echelon because... He's another guy who's looked fantastic in Bellator, has only lost to the yeah. top competition, and, like, and doesn't get the credit. And and one and PFL like they have names too, and PFL is still like pretty much just getting started. And but the like, other thing about them though is they develop their own talent. Mm -hmm. One gets talent from like other combat sports like Muay Thai, Jiu Jitsu, and they build them into MMA fighters, or they keep them in that discipline. And then the PFL, you know, we made fun of how the Challenger series is like a rip-off of the Contender Series, but at least they're building talent. Like, that's more than Bellator is doing right now. Uh, it, it's so unfortunate because the stars in that promotion are truly, like, the best in the world. Like, they deserve yeah. that type of credit. It's just and the Bell divisions around them. They're not there. For Bellator 2 to have something like, you know, their Grand Prix tournament, which is like obviously like so cool to have it's almost like it well now fun. you have the pfl has you know their own tournament as well and in terms of people that are actually like i guess going to like i guess stick in terms of um you know i guess maybe drawing in new fans and whatnot and getting booked for like bigger fights like you know pfl i think has that 
bigger luxury right now. So, um, like, look at the, they just booked Derek Brunson versus um, Ray Cooper. Mm-hmm. Like, there you go. That's how you get your fighter credit. Like, Ray Cooper's another one. They didn't give him credit until he beat guys like Rory McDonald, and now he's fighting Derek Brunson. They're giving their stars the opportunity to, to prove themselves. Bellator, they give their stars that opportunity like once every year and a half, two years. It, it's just like... I think... I don't know, with man. It's them, it's, <laughs> with them, it's like, you know, we have, we have these guys. We have these guys. These other promotions don't. So, you know, watch these guys be as dominant as they actually really are. As he, as they actually really are, yeah. instead of like you know, you'll watch you know like like I say in a UFC fight where you know they're like I even with Michael Chandler you could say Michael Chandler once like I'm who I'm gonna bring up again as a matter of fact, who's in his UFC career has not been shy whatsoever to just standing and taking as much damage and trying to give it out as much as possible like just truly just trying to give you know everybody who's watching like hey there's nothing you can dispute about this like yeah i took but which you can't actually it's like well you did well, take me, a lot of damage let me say this too you know people see how good michael chandler is now and he's had like a 50 50 record in the ufc but a lot of impressive fights nonetheless he was this good in bellator people just didn't yeah. give him the credit like and he lost he lost to pitbull at one point Pitbull's another guy who's expressed interest in coming to the UFC at some point in his career. Like, these guys, some of them want to be loyal to Bellator. At some point, they just get tired of being disrespected by the fans. Not as much by the media. I mean, like, me and you, we're talking about them in the way that they deserve to be talked about. Yeah, there's pretty much, it's, there's nowhere to, like, there's really nowhere to go up. Except go to you Another know, promotion, UFC, like, yeah. Not even just the UFC. Yeah, like, they could promotion. go to the PFL and one, and they could still have better competition. Just the UFC is where they're going to get the bulk of that credit because yeah. they're number one right now. Yeah. They probably will be for quite a while. Mm-hmm. But yeah, man. You know, to end it on a positive note, like I said, Bellator three hundred was a hit. I thought it was a good event. They did a good job at hyping it up. Like I said, I think the fourth title fight falling out did end up helping. And then all three of those champions, like you said, they got to showcase how good they are. Yeah. Carmouche, Cyborg, and Usman Nurmagomedov. And that's, yeah, but, that's the thing. I, it's, it's, obviously, it's not the best approach, but it's, it's, you know, by now, like, I think, we you know, like, it's the approach, Bellator, like, that's just where, like, I guess this, like, where they're, I guess these championships come, these championship fights kind of like formulate like the champion. Okay, champion is supposed to, you know, they want the clear underdog, they want the champion to be the clear favorite, and then what happens happens. And so when the champion is clearly dominating the challenger, it's like, well, duh, because you're not, you're not, you're not these other, you know, you're not these other promotions. But like in this case, I'll talk like mainly UFC. Like you're not UFC where you can, you know, put on a like a Bobby, even just a Bobby Green and Grant Dawson, and then Bobby Green's the one knocking Grant Dawson out in thirty seconds. Like, you know, it would be one of the better fights on a Bellator undercard that I've seen in years. Like, yeah. and that's a UFC main event that I'm more excited for than. A couple of title fights in, in certain promotions like it's really night and day when it comes to the marketing and the way that uh the way that they match fighters up against each other but yeah. i don't know man i will say this it was a good card bellator 300 they do deserve credit for that you just wonder if they might be up for sale if or it's something like that sell. i don't know there it just strikes me as odd that like this is the peak for them, and it doesn't seem like there's even, like, any inkling to try and get better than that. Like I said, they just missed out on another big free agent. So, yeah. I don't know. They, they have to do something unless the, there's already something in the works, you know what I mean? So, yeah. Let us know in the comments what you guys thought. Do you guys like UFC Vegas 80 or Bellator 300 better? But, uh, 
that's it for us this week. And uh, we'll <laughs> it's just honestly like just a crazy question, you know. Yeah. I know there's only three. It title is crazy. Isn't it? There's supposed to be four, and even then there's three title plays. Well, let me put it like this: like the fact that we're asking people, yeah, did you prefer the card with three title fights, or did you prefer a, a fight card with a top ten ranked lightweight and someone else who wasn't ranked, <laughs> and then the unranked guy upset the top ten guy? So it's just like so funny how things turn out. But I thought it was pretty even. That's why I'm genuinely. Yeah, it's begging fair. the question. Yeah. So let us know what you guys think. Like the video, subscribe if you haven't already, and we'll see y'all.